He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Willis family. In the midst of grieving, still able to share with us. Next up, we'll have uh, several tributes and remarks. They'll be coming in this order. We have Charles Wims and the Sisson family, and then a special tribute from the in-laws, followed by the grandchildren. So Charles Wims and the Sisson family. Bless the Lord. Amen. John Willis got saved. Amen, brother. After all these years, John Willis got saved. And sometimes, you know, a minister one time told me that what I'm getting ready to say may not be exactly correct in the order of it. But we as humans, we like to imagine and we like to think. Can you imagine? Pastor Hampton and Sister Hampton and Sister Maggie and Brother and Sister Draw and Sister Elaine in heaven, my Lord, rejoicing, my Lord. walking through the, the streets of gold yes, sir. and look over and see John Willis, Sr., coming through those gates. Oh, my goodness, what a day. What a day of rejoicing. I met John when I was just a teenager. Uh, John had came and, and uh, to the church, I was a teenager, and he, he, Sister Willis. And, uh, you know, that's when they lived in Ypsilanti. And for whatever reason, from time to time, John couldn't get the family to church and he called Pastor Hampton and he'd always call me by my first and my last name, probably others too, but Charles Williams. Talk real fast. Charles Williams. And he called the pastor. Tell Charles Williams to go get Maggie and then bring him to church. So I'd go get him up in Ipsy and bring him to church. And uh, we all got close. I had a grandmother that lived in Rock Island, Illinois. John, being a truck driver, found out about her. And many times he would stop in and visit. My aunt was an excellent cook. Of course, John enjoyed that. And he would stay with him from time to time. I think Robin even helped him drive home from Rock Island, Illinois one time. We became close. I liked to fish. John liked to fish. In some kind of way, John would always call me. He'd say, Charles Williams, bring me some fish. So I'd take him some fish. And I don't know how John always knew when I went fishing, but somehow in a way he would find out that I went fishing. And he'd get the word out to me. Tell Charles Williams to bring me some fish. And I would do it, of course. Speaking of fishing, that re John reminds me, his life reminds me of Peter, John, and Andrew. When they came in contact with Jesus, and the truth that Jesus taught, what did they do? They went and told their families. They went and told their families about a man. And when John came in contact with this truth, he went and told Maggie. Yeah. Wow. Maggie went and told her children. Lord, Those children went and told their children and their friends. Put it together, brother. And now those grandchildren are teaching John's great-grandchildren about this truth. Amen. The scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. John bought this truth and you couldn't move him from it. Whether he was in it or not, John bought this truth and you couldn't move him from it. I think about the thought came to me this morning fishing for the generations to come. That's what John did. Not really being saved, not being saved, but John was a fisherman for God. He bought so many to this truth. 
I was thinking, all those that are Willis's in here, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand. Now I want to see all those that has been blessed by the Willis family one way or another. You've been blessed. You've been touched by the Willis family. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All those that have been blessed and touched by the Willis family. John Willis was a great fisherman, as you can see. And we're thankful for John and his contribution and for the Willis family and their contribution. I was touched greatly when the Willis family asked me to have these words. And I just pray and trust that something today has been said that would encourage you, that would lift your spirits, and that would carry you throughout this day. Let's give God glory for John Willis. Amen. It is indeed an honor to be here this morning. And the family asked us to speak on behalf of their father. I met John in 1974 through the late Maggie Willis, who was my bestest. She was my best friend. If ever you had a best friend, she was my best friend, but we're not here to talk about her today. We're going to uplift John. I just thank God for John, the husband that he was. When I met him, he had a, a business. He had money in his pocket. He dressed sharp. He was a fine-looking man. He had green eyes and light skin. <laughs> That was the man that I met. <laughs> and I'm so thankful to have met them. He had a new home, tri-level, furnished, all fine. John, John had all kind of toys. LaVon had a canopy bed. Oh, it was beautiful. Brand new Cadillac. You name it, John had it. But um, he was a good provider as well. He took care of his children. That's one thing John did. He took care of his children, took care of Maggie. Whatever she needed, whatever she wanted, whatever he had to do to get it, John did that. He was a good cook. His macaroni and cheese was one of the best I ever had. And uh, just to give an instance of his character, we were on a trip going to Georgia. There was a great loss in the family. Sister Willis had lost her brother and sister-in-law, and we on our road, on our way down the road, going to Georgia. And uh, we stopped at a gas station, and everybody got in the car. We going on down the road, maybe about 30 or 40 miles, I'm not sure. One of the children from the back seat said, I believe it was Lando, Mom, where's John John? And we looked in the back, and there was no John John. And we had to turn around, you'd have thought we was in a jet, because we, I mean, John flew back down that highway all the way to pick up his son from that gas station. And John John stood out there, was waiting on us to come back. <laughs> Just appreciate the Lord for that. And then as you travel, you know how you get sleepy. And, uh, but, but John didn't like us sleeping on him, so he'd pull up by a big semi and he'd swerve the wheel. Ah, we, ah, John, John. Oh, I tell you, we had a time on that trip. <laughs> But that's his character, and he'd just crack up. He'd just think it was so funny, he'd just crack up. But I'm so thankful to ever had met this family. I mean, they're, they're like a family to me. They're these children, John, uh, LaVon, Cena, Quita, Winslow, oh, they, they're just like family. I was there when, when the rest of them were born, not for LaVon and John, but I was there when the rest of them were born. And uh, right there when Maggie was going to the hospital, rushing up there, and laboring and all of that. But I thank God uh, how he blessed us down through the years. And, and uh, 
you know, Maggie was a singer. <laughs> she, always, she was so sweet. She'd always try to help whoever try to sing. And so I tried to sing me a special one Sunday, <laughs> and John <laughs> happened to be in church. And I was down to singing. And after church, he said, Sister Brad, this is how you sound. Jesus came. I said, John. <laughs> He would tease you so he would tease you something terrible. But that was just his character. And if he loved you, he was going to tease you. So I just thank God for that. But uh, I met John. He was on a high note. I mean, he was flying high. God knows he was. He was doing well. But I'm so thankful for his end. He left here on a greater note. God saved him. I went up there to the hospital to see John a few, day, a few days before he got saved. He'd always say, me, Sister Credit, I'm not going to hell. I ain't going to hell. I'm not going to hell. I said, Well, John, how you going to get there if you don't get saved? You got to get saved. I'm going to get saved. I'm going to get saved. Uh, I'm not going to hell. And don't you know, Marcina had a burden for her dad. Called the pastor, said, I don't want to see my daddy leave here without salvation. And don't you know, God saved John. That is a miracle land there. That's a miracle at his age and, and sick. But God saved him. I'm so grateful, so thankful. It's just a blessing to my heart. And I can imagine what they must be feeling in heaven to see John Willis come through those pearly gates saved. Children, be faithful. Hold on. Your mother's there, now your dad's there. Try to get there and meet them before it's too late. I'm grateful to have met the Willis family. I was probably about three years old at the time in, in 1974. And um, just reflecting back on meeting them, like my mother said, they were a very affluent family. Um, to go to their house was my happy place. Levine will tell you, she had every Barbie with everything to go to it, and then their basement was just full of toys. So my earliest recollection of an encounter with, Ms. with Papa Willis, I was bouncing, and I was happy, and I was on my way into the house, and he was coming out of the house, and I said, hi, John. And he stopped and looked at me, and to this day, I can't tell you what he said, but I knew within about 45 seconds that I was to never call him by his first name. I was to always address every adult, male or female, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. He didn't play, he was huge on respect. So that was my first encounter with him. And then as time went on, we were young and I was a big crybaby and I was always crying. And then a lot of people think that the musical talent only came from Sister Willis. But Papa Willis also had musical talent. And he taught us a song. And if you want the lyrics when, I'm, when, when church is out, we'll let you. Um, it was a song, Don't Cry, Little Girl, Don't Cry. <laughs> and then we were getting older as teenagers. And he either taught Levine or he taught all of us, I'm not quite sure. But it was another song. We were dealing with boyfriends or whatever and getting heartbroken and he he taught us the song I got along before I met you gonna get along without you now so Jay and Javier Papa Willis was dropping lyrics way before y'all and as I became a woman I had gotten pregnant with Haley and he saw me and I, I was trying real hard to let him see me I was moving quick and he said Jay you pregnant? I said, yes, sir. Oh, Lord, that, that baby gonna look like a monster. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have thought that I would have gotten offended, but I didn't. I was used to that. That was Mr. Willis. He was very blunt, very honest. And little did he know I was already praying because I knew if my features and my husband's features ended up on Haley the wrong way, we would have something to behold. <laughs> So when I had her, he saw me at church, and I was like, oh, Lord, I don't want him to see my child. And he said, come here, come here. Let me see that baby. And he looked at her. He said, oh, 
you did good, you did good. <laughs> pretty little thing, pretty little thing. And just from that, um, we've, we've grown as a, as a family, we've bonded. My children call him Papa Willis. And one thing I can say about him is he was constant. He was always present. Family gatherings, dinners, open houses, weddings, graduations, he was always there. We had a birthday party and took over the restaurant. You knew Mr. Willis was, Papa Willis was going to be there. And I'm going to miss him. I'm going to miss his presence. And I just want to applaud the family how well you all did in caring for him. Quita, stopping your life and moving in with him. Levine being that protector. Cena being the the constant when they need her she right there went slow everybody played a role john and even the in-laws for letting everyone you know play their part and i just want to thank god that he saved him at the end Amen. i'm grateful for his life i'm so glad to have known him and if you all need me i'm there for you you know i love you with all my heart yeah. i mean the lord bless you Good afternoon, everyone. When I was asked to do this tribute for my father-in-law, I felt very honored. For most of you that don't know me, I am Mary Willis. I married John Jr. I want to share my experience that I had, some of them, with my father-in-law. I'll start with the bond. After we had gotten married um, in 87, I must have did something that he didn't like. And um, I really didn't, I don't remember what it was, but I know he didn't like it because he wouldn't speak to me for about a week. <laughs> so I thought to myself, now I know he likes me, at least I think he does, but I, I w he would let me in the house when I would go over there but he wouldn't speak to me. I would be like, how you doing? He wouldn't say anything. And I thought, okay, we can't have this. So one day I had some news and I went over to the house to share it with my mother-in-law and she wasn't there. But he let me in. I said, hello, nothing. I was like, okay. He sat down in the living room and he began to read the paper. And I said, so you're not gonna even talk to me? He said nothing. So I had to use a little psychology on him because the news that I brought was I was pregnant. So I said to myself, I'm gonna break him. So I sat there and I said, you know, it's a shame that my babies won't even know their grandfathers. At the time, my father lived out of town and he threw that paper down. He said, what did you say? Oh. Mary, you pregnant? Ah! And he ran into, the, into his room and got on the phone and called Brother Hampton. And I said, mm-hmm, you can talk. And that was the bond that started from there. Another instance I want to share is um, my, one of my sisters always made banana pudding for me, just a little personal one. And this particular year, she couldn't do it. And so I was talking to my mother-in-law about it, you know, how I was gonna miss that banana pudding for my birthday. Well, he overheard her. And so she went out, and I didn't know till later, she went out and she bought everything and was gonna surprise me um, for my birthday. Well, I got a knock on the door about 10, 10.30, and it was my father-in-law, and he had a huge pan of banana pudding. And I was like, oh, Thank you so much. I was so happy that he thought about me and my birthday until I opened up the banana pudding. I don't like the custard. He had scrambled the eggs. So on top and put it in the oven. That's not how you make the custard, the yolk and everything. So when I opened it, I had scrambled egg banana pudding. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I know he's going to ask me how does it taste. And I'm like, John, you got to bail me out. He was like, nope. 
you on your own. So I tasted a little bit of the custard and I, I left it like that, but it was actually eggs in the banana pudding. Another thing that I liked was tuna, and I was pregnant with, uh, I believe it might have been Jay or one of the children, and I had bought everything to make the tuna. I was at the house, and he said, um, I make the tuna for you, Mary. I make the tuna for you. And I was like, you know how to make tuna the way I like it? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So I let him make the tuna, went in there. It had mustard in it. It had eggs, the mustard, onions, celery. He just, I was like, uh. I cannot eat this, you know, so I was kind of upset about that. And then the last food thing I want to talk about, I like fish. And so he called me one day, he said, I got some fish for you. I was like, you do? He said, yeah, I'm going to put it on the porch. I said, I'm going to go right there and get it. We pull up to the house. It was a big fish, uncooked, eyes, everything, staring up, looking at me. I was like, Grandpa, no, you got me. He was like, all you got to do is scale it. I said, I can't. You know, I got this thing with eyes. I said, I, I just can't. The lips, everything. And he like, you got to cook it. I'm like, I can't. So then he said, I'll cook it. He comes back and get it. And I promise you, it seemed like a half hour later, he was back with the fish. I did not eat it. It didn't look cooked. It was thick. I was like, okay, Grandpa, you got me on that one, too. The other thing, um, Grandpa will call you every day at least 10 times. He will call and ask you the same thing. What's the number to the King Center? I said, Grandpa, I just told you that. Okay, I forgot where I put it. Give the number again. 15, 20 minutes later, again and again and again. So I, you know, just kind of start turning the phone off. That was Grandpa. Um, grandpa was school days, birthdays. Any time that I needed him to pick up the children from school or whatever, he would be there. He would be there. I remember um, for my birthday one year, um, after my mom passed, he was there. He was such a great support. After my mother passed, he said, um, he began to just give me a card, either my birthday or Mother's Day. And then he graduated to putting money in the card. And I was like, wow. So every birthday, if he missed the card on the birthday, he would give me money on Mother's Day. And it was $5. But you know what? I love that $5 because it came from him and it came from his heart. And I felt like if, this, if he would go through this much just to get me a little card, just to let me know that he didn't forget about my birthday, I love that $5 as if it was 100 At The birth of my children, Grandpa was there for pretty much all of them. About 6.30 in the morning after I've had the baby or whatever, the hospital would say, you have a visitor. And I'm like, I do? Who comes that early in the morning to visit people? It was Grandpa. He just wanted to look in and he'll say, yep, it's the Willis. And I'm like, who else is it going to be? <laughs> He did that with every one of them. He would look at them, look at their features, and say, yep, it's the Willis. So I, I, I look forward to that. <laughs> like I said, he was a great support. Um, whatever, I didn't try to use it that much, but sometimes if I say, Grandpa, I have a taste for something, and he would, he would get it. He was like, I ain't got no money, Mary. And I was like, okay. But I knew that he was going to knock on that door, and he was going to bring it to me. That was the relationship that we had. Um, as someone said, holidays, birthdays, family gatherings, just to see him there, just to see him there in his presence always meant so much to me. At church, we would sit together, and I would say to him, you're not singing. And he'd look at me, and he'd say, I know. And I'd get him a book, and I'd say, Grandpa, you got to sing. Everybody is singing. And he said, no, I can't sing that song. And I said, why not? And he said, I don't have the experience. That's not my testimony. And I felt like, oh, my goodness, let me make sure that what I'm singing, I got the experience to go with it, too. You know, that was powerful coming from someone that wasn't saved at the time. But, you know, one song came to my mind that Grandpa used to always request, and that was the song that the late Lily Mae Green used to sing. And it was called, Oh, My Record Will Be There. And Grandpa would just sit in church. And he would cry, and he would cry, and he would cry. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, he's under so much conviction. Well, I asked my mother-in-law, I said, why does, he, why does he just come and he just sit and cry? 
And she said, he requested that song. I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, the song has um, some of the lyrics talk about um, in a day that is not fire and the blazing judgment bar is there, the awful summons will be read. And it goes on and it talks about every secret, idle thought will be brought into judgment. Every lie, everything would be brought into judgment. And he would just sit there and cry just to think about everything, no doubt, that happened throughout his life. But on October 14, 2020, up in the hospital with Chunky and Brother Lee as his witness, God erased all of that. Everything, the blood took it away. And when I came back up there, uh, Chunky texted me and said, Mama, Grandpa got saved. And I'm like, what? And then he explained to me what happened when I went up there to get him. I could see the change on his face. The blood had worked a perfect cure. It had cleansed his heart, and you could see a difference. The children could see a difference. Everybody that saw him, it was a difference, and it wasn't fake. It was for real. God had came and touched his heart. And so as I was looking through the lyrics of the song, at the end, it says something about one of, one of the, uh, I think the fifth stanza of that song says, um, he will answer in my place. After he look at all those records, when he stand before God, God will answer in his place. And that's exactly what God did. God answered. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Everything that he, list, that he probably had going through his head while he was sitting there in church requesting that song, God took it all away. And to that, I am so happy. I want to thank my husband, John. I want to thank my sister-in-laws, Levon, Marcina, and Quita. I want to thank my brother-in-law, Winslow, for 33 years of an amazing journey with my father-in-law. He loved me, and he was so good to me. And I want to thank you all for sharing him. I want to thank you all for taking the time to just let him come over to my house and just being there for me. And I want to appreciate, thank you and appreciate you for that. I'm going to miss Grandpa so much. I'm going to miss him coming up to my house and blowing that horn and everybody know he's there and just the family gatherings and with the children, all of it. And I just want to say thank you. Wow. Um, I'm Larry <laughs> and Pops, you know, that was my man. And anybody know on a Facebook friend, we got some adventures on there, so I ain't got time to go through all of them, but just go back and look at them. But, you know, I want to say this, I'm glad to hear that, you know, it was shocked to me and surprising that he got saved and not because I didn't believe that he believed. I know he believed because me and him would have conversations and I would, because I would bring him to church. I would drive from the south side, ride out there and pick him up. He'd come, same routine, stop at the dollar store. Get some peppermint, fill his pockets up, jump out and leave the paper on my floor. <laughs> but one time, you know, we was talking about it and I got a different ideology about it and me and him was talking and uh, I say, he asked me, he said, yeah, something. I said, oh. pops on, I don't believe that. You a lie? You a lie? Larry, you sitting there lying right now, lie. You looking at me lying? If you, if you don't believe that, then you, then you don't believe this. I said, I don't believe that either. That's dumb, Larry, that's dumb. I can't believe you sitting there saying that, Larry, that's dumb. <laughs> he wasn't scared. He gonna say what he wanted to say. If he didn't believe it, he didn't like it, he gonna say he ain't like it. So I knew how to deal with Pops because he a lot like his daughter. He got a lot of ways, they stubborn, they get an idea in their head. You ain't gonna change, you get the book. I don't care what that book say. Lay, lay, you know, I know, I know, Larry. So, me and Pops, we would go, you know, on our little adventures. I'd pick him up, whatever he wanted to do. We'd run around. We're supposed to be one trip, turns to half a day. You know, we go here, we go there. And I said, I said, Pop, I said, Pop, man, I, I ain't got time, man. I ain't got time to be uh, uh, running around. Larry, Larry, let's just drive the car, Larry. Let's drive the car, Larry. And now, if I act serious, because he loved Cadillacs, and I had the Lincoln, well, this ain't no Cadillac. But it's just, it's just dry good. It ain't no Cadillac. Because he liked what he liked. You know, Hardy Dave, whatever he liked, he liked. So, and if he knew you liked something, he was going, he, he would, 
You know, he cooked some neck, some I think it was chicken, yeah, chicken neck. And I said, man, I said, man, that was good. That was good, pop. Next day, he knocked on the door. Look what I got. Pot this tall. Nothing but chicken neck. Tion and Tyson, they were little, we ain't eating that. No. <laughs> I said, I can't eat all these chicken necks. <laughs> well, Marcin said, don't tell, don't tell my daddy you like something, because he's he going to bring it. He's going to get it for you. But if, he, if any of his, and, and another thing that I learned from Pop, you know, the love for his family, the love for his children, you know, and you can see some of the attributes of his children and all of them. Winslow, John, they all got attributes of Pop, you know. Marcina may have the strongest, but they all, you know, the seed. But, you know, one time he, he was playing the lottery, you know, and I, I said, I said, Pops, I said, man, I ain't never seen that so much on the lottery now. I think it was up to 300. 300, you ain't playing? Like, that's just 300 million. I said, Pop, what you gonna do with 300 million dollars? You ain't got time to spend 300 million dollars. He, uh oh, oh, I'm splitting it with my kids, like, I don't need no money. I'm splitting it with my kids. And he was serious. He looked me right in my eyes. And I'm like, you know, it ain't it ain't for him. You know, he was always thinking about about his, you know, his children, you know, and the love. But I got two. I got I got countless stories because we rode. But there's two stories that came to mind because he came. To, he lived with us for a year or so, and, and pops. And that's a battle in itself between two strong wheels, him and Marcina. And I'm in the middle. You know what I'm saying? He asked me. I'm like, pops, you got to talk to Marcina. You know. So she, oh, he love it hot. I don't mean warm, hot. So he cranks the heat up to 75, 80 degrees. We wake up sweating. Marcin, Dad, Dad, don't turn that, don't turn it up. Oh, oh, you ain't want to heat up? Oh, okay, Cena, okay, okay, all right. We get back in the bed, get our blankets back on, wake back up, it's back up. This three, four times in one night, you know, so one night, it's summertime, it's warm. I said, I ain't never, you know, I, I wasn't raised with my dad, so I never lived, I never lived, lived with a man like that, you know. And uh, Pops was staying there, it's, it's warm. I said, I'm gonna ease up. I'm in my boxes, I look all around, everybody sleep, I'm tipping, making sure ain't no kids up. I bend the corner, and there go Pops in his box in the refrigerator. Hey, hey, Larry, hey, Larry. I said, hey, Larry. And then I went back upstairs. I got to be out there. I said, I, I ain't used to this. There's only one man with boxes on in this house. <laughs> so, you know, so then another, the last final incident, I come downstairs. It's, it's like 80, 90 degrees. We got a pit bull. I get downstairs. Marcina's working night. She knocked out. I get down there, pit bull just hollering, barking, <laughs> going crazy. I, get, I reach the kitchen. I didn't know what it was at the time. It's fur everywhere and blood. I'm like, man, what, what's going on in here? I, I opened the garage door and Tyson, look, Dad, look. I said, what is that? What is that? A rabbit heart. Granddad gave it to me. I said, oh. I said, what? Now, I'm known for the street. Go anybody tell you I don't snitch, but this is my first snitching adventure. This is too much. I went back upstairs. I plopped on the bed, act like it was a mistake. I said, I ain't mean to wake you up, but. Your dad down there with fur and blood all over the kitchen, dog going crazy, and Tyson got a rabbit heart. I don't know when her feet hit the ground, but all I heard was. <laughs> 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 I say, man, <laughs> I said, this is too much, boy. I said, <laughs> but I love Pops, and, uh, it's just, you know, I used to ask Pops, and that's, that's the only reason I say surprised when I heard he got saved. When I used to take him on the rides and we, and we would get serious and we would talk, and he always, you know, he always had the belief, you know. He just stepped into the faith, so he became saved. But he always had a belief in the strong, and there's two things he was constant about. I always asked him about periodically. One, I always tease him when these ladies be Older women there, wherever we at, and they talking to him. I say, oh, Pops, got him. Got you, got you one now. I, 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 I got a wife, Maggie Willis. I got, I got a wife, Larry, Maggie Willis. That he always said that. And secondly, I would always say, he say something, I say, Pops, when he wasn't drinking his little beer or whatever, he'd be on his, not drinking or anything, going. I said, Pops, man, you keep going to church and everything, you ain't drinking, you might well get saved. I, 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 can't, get, I can't get saved, Larry. Larry, I can't get saved. 
And he was looking serious. And I never, you know, I'm not, I don't type of person. I'm not going to press you and ask why you think that is or whatever. But he had said that. He had told me that. You know what I mean? So many times. So when, when he told me that he had got saved, I was glad for him because I knew that was in his heart. But he had actually believed that he couldn't. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't that he didn't want to. I, he probably, I don't know, he might have did so much wrong. You know what I'm saying? That he might have thought he couldn't come back. But I was glad to hear that he got saved. I love him. He know I love him. I love him to the, to the I, I went to come see him. And the last time I come to see him, <clears throat> he was out there and he was, he was kind of upset. You know, he said he wanted to go home. And, you know, he, when he wanted his way, he going to ask me. Same way as my sister-in-law. They going to bypass Marcina. They going to ask me. And he said, they say, L -l 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 -l. tell him to stop acting stupid. Take me home. And I'm like, it's out of my hands. I ain't say nothing. So Marcina, you know, she constant on him. Yeah, who am I? Who am I? What's my name? Say my name. Go on, go on, go on, go on with me, Quita. Because first name come out of my mouth going to be Quita. Qu go on with me, Quita. She said, I ain't Quita. What's my name? What's my name? He said, I know who you is. He, she kept on walking through that game and said, you Larry wife. <laughs> so remember that, Larry wife. Next up, there's a tribute to the grandchildren, right? One, all of them. All the grandchildren, come on up here. Terrell gonna speak for them, thank you. But all come and support Brother Terrell. Beautiful grandchildren. So I'll start this off. How y'all doing? Um, Terrell Willis, John Willis' son, John Willis Jr.'s son. I'm the oldest of the uh, grandchildren. Um, I, um, this is not my uh, strong suit at all. Um, but I uh, appreciate the support um, from the saints, from the friends and the family out there. Um, Got a lot of memories of Grandpa. Um, heard a lot of stories from Grandpa from my dad. Um, uh, so growing up, and to be honest with you, I didn't understand Grandpa until I was like 16. Couldn't couldn't understand him. He spoke so fast, but uh, you know, I got some. All of the memories that I got of Grandpa was pretty much just funny. Um, to him, just tormenting us when we were. Uh, at grandma and grandpa's house, he would have something weird in the kitchen. Always something weird. I mean, some turtle, rabbit, like for us, he would have something different. And I'm like, I'm not trying it. I know I'm not trying it. The only thing I know you can make is some macaroni and cheese. So everything else is, I'm not gonna try it. And uh, you know, he would always try to get me to, he would try to camouflage it. I'm like, no, nope, no, nope. I, know, I know that's not something normal. So um, another memory. Uh, I hope Quita don't mind me sharing this. Quita said she don't remember this. Um, but I was young. I think I was probably like eight, eight or nine years old. Uh, I think Grandpa had a blue Cadillac. And uh, we were sitting there, and he had picked me and Terrence up. Uh, Quita was in the front seat. And um, you no, know, this is after all, all the stories that my dad had gave me about how hard Grandpa was, how tough he was, and all the different things he did. And, um, you know, the whole yes, sir, yes, yes, ma'am, and all that. And uh, I'm driving, we're, we're driving, and Grandpa's driving, 
and uh, her Quita and Grandpa is, you know, having some type of conversation. And I'm, I'm alert, you know. I, I realize there's some tension there, and uh, Quita had talked back, and I said, "Wow, you know," I was like, uh, "Something's about to happen," and so uh, I look up, and uh, Grandpa's hand slid off the steering wheel, and I'm talking the fastest backhand I've ever seen in my life, and. Uh, Quita just stood there. You, she was just kind of shocked. And I looked at Terrence. I think Terrence was sleeping. And then I was like, man, you can't talk back to Grandpa, you know. And um, But I'm going to definitely miss Grandpa. Um, he would, You know, when I got saved and I was surprised to see this dude still coming to church faithfully, he was just coming and coming and coming. And um, I'm like, man, Grandpa's, you got a, you know, tough, tough heart. And uh, I remember at... Um, Big Eye's graduation, his high school graduation. Um, Grandpa had made some uh, macaroni and cheese or cheesy potatoes, and um, he dropped the cheesy potatoes. And, uh, you know, he had a little episode, and um, Quita had grabbed me aside. I said, you got to go. She was like, you got to go talk to your grandpa. And this is when I knew I had, like, a glimpse of Grandpa being saved because I never seen Grandpa cry, you know, other than the services. Um, but I went over there, and uh, he was crying. You know, he was sitting down. And uh, I said, Grandpa, what's going on, man? And uh, he just looked at me. He said, man, he's like, I want to do this right. I just wanted to do this right. And um, I, he was talking about the macaroni and cheese, but I, I just felt, you know, something that was on him. And uh, I said, okay. I said, okay, Grandpa, you're going to be all right. We got some more food in there. Um, and I started teasing him. I was like, your macaroni and cheese ain't even that good anyways. And then he just started laughing, you know. And then I said, from uh, from that moment on, you know, um, I was like, somehow Grandpa going to get saved. And then uh, he started to decline, you know, you get the cause. And and I'm like, <clears throat> okay. So, so heard so many different stories, you know, from my dad hit about his near-death experiences working around death. And I'm like, man, Grandpa's tough, man. You know, Grandpa's tough. And so... And then uh, I think I was with him, with Brother Lee, the day before he got saved. And we was just talking to him and talking to him. I'm like, man, you know, it looked like he was on the way down. You know, it was, it was low. And then, like, the next day he got saved, man. I was so happy. I was like, man, this dude really saved, you know. And then I um, got the privilege of helping him come to the church. And um, when he got baptized and uh, got to spend uh, a lot of time with him. He's seen all of my children. Um, Brooklyn's got the same birthday as him. Um, I'm sitting here, you know, we, we would laugh and I, I'll ask him as the, uh, he would watch the, watch the services go on and he's asking me all these people's name. I'm like, who's this, who's this, who's this, who's this? I'm like, my grandpa, that's just so-and-so, that's brother so-and-so. And he's like, okay. And then I always bring out a uh, a clip of Brother Hampton. I say, who is this? And he would just look at me. He's like, are you stupid? And I'm like, no. I, I was like, who is this? And he's like, that's my pastor. And then I was like, okay. And I always check him. So he was, he was alert. But um, I'm a miss grandpa. Um, I, again, I appreciate um, all y'all support. I appreciate the family. I appreciate the sisters, Winslow, um, dad. You know, I love y'all. Um, We're going to continue to hold y'all up in prayer as well. And at this time, I think Katia and Tia wanted to say something as well. <clears throat> um okay so i kind of like just for a little a few things down just because i might get nervous so i was like ah gramps 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 granddaddy grandpa was fine <laughs> like i had a very nice looking grandfather um i remember like younger i didn't really understand what grandpa was saying but i remember being scared to like keep asking him because i don't know like what's what he gonna say like he just made me like scared to like keep asking him like what because i didn't really understand what he was saying and um i remember uh grandpa would make this straight face like when you act something stupid i feel like literally my dad makes it big i make it i make it it's like if you say something you just be like he just look at you with that face like are you retarded or are you like silly and then um also i remember um uh one time at auntie quita's house grandpa was standing there and um i had like we was watching the service in um his room that he was in i had kind of like started dozing off and grandpa was like telling me to wake up he's like get up wake up whatever i'm like 
the man, the grandpa's telling me to wake up. And then um, I was still like, like those, like still laying down. And then he was just, and I look over and grandpa's just looking, like waiting for me just to like listen to him. So I obeyed him, of course. And then grandpa, um, I remember grandpa and his peppermints sitting next to him at church. Um, grandpa coming to church, um, just about every Sunday until he like really started getting sick in his body. One of the scriptures that reminds me of grandpa is in Proverbs 19.23, how it says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. And I feel like he definitely was able to have the, he was a, he had a fear of God and a fear of this truth. And that allowed him, um, God, to have mercy on his soul. And then, um, I remember I had heard about Grandpa's cheating habits and his games <laughs> when you would play him in games. And so when Grandpa was in the hospital, I had played him in checkers. And then he started cheating. And I'm like, Grandpa is really cheating. And I was like, oh, that's how we plan? So I'm about to start cheating. So I started cheating. And then Grandpa started getting mad at me and like, oh, like getting so upset and everything. I'm like, yep, that's right. I won. <laughs> And then um, I remember Grandpa kept saying he wants to like go home at the hospital, and so I'm like, so I'm like Grandpa, you can't get up, like you can't get out of the bed. And then he like want to start getting up to leave. I'm like, oh God, like oh Lord, like I'm about to start to try to stop Grandpa. Like, how good is that going to go? And then thankfully, I think like the nurses had come in. And so that was Grandpa before salvation when he was cheating. And then I heard Grandpa got saved, and I'm like, oh, well, thank the Lord, because he was just cheating, in the, cheating, playing checkers with me in the hospital. And then um, I remember our last, like, actual verbal conversation in the hospital. I was like, Grandpa, I was like, Grandpa, do you know who I am? And then he, like, looked at me, so I'm, like, thinking something hopeful and happy. He's like, why would you ask a stupid question like that? I'm like, oh, my goodness, Lord have mercy. And so, um, and then I was like, Grandpa, I'm like, that was not a stupid question. I'm like, you know, kind of being a little like Nene, like, that was not a stupid question. And then I kind of looked, got a little defensive, and then I was like, okay, and then I felt bad about that. So I was like, I'm sorry, Grandpa, like, for being defensive. And then he just looked at me and was like, it's okay. And I was just like, I just really appreciated that and his little half smirk. And then, like Terrell was saying, Grandpa and the Snapping Turtles. And we all love Grandpa, like they said. He was definitely at our events. He was very present in our life. In the morning that Grandpa passed away, I didn't know he was going to pass, but the scripture that I had in my devotion was Philippians 1.21. It says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm very happy that my grandfather is in heaven is at peace. Hi guys, um, I'm Tian, Marcina's daughter, and I'm a crybaby. <laughs> I'm a crybaby. Grandpa knew that. <laughs> he used to sing that crybaby song that Sister Sherry was talking about. <laughs> he sing it. It was like this. Don't cry, little girl. Don't cry. <laughs> don't cry, little girl. Don't cry. If you cry, you'll spoil your, those brown pretty eyes. brown eyes. Don't cry, little girl. Don't cry. <laughs> um... I love Grandpa a lot, much like everyone else in the sanctuary today. Um, he was very special to me. Um, my parents were split, um, and before Frog came along and helped out so much, uh, Grandpa was like my father figure, Tyson and I. Um, he was always around, he came to everything. He called me when I finally got a cell phone. He'd be like, what you doing? And I'd be like, nothing. He'd be like, all right, I'm on my way. He'd be like, you got $10? I'd be like, yeah. And he'd get there, and his tank was on E. And we'd go to the gas station. He'd be like, all right, we're going to the store. We'd go to the store. We'd stop by Black Girl's house. He'd always have a car full of food. He was always giving other people. He'd take so much food over to Blackwell's house. And then we'd leave Blackwell's house with like eight pounds of fish, too, in a cooler. Um, and then we end up in Belleville at Queen's house. <laughs> it was always an adventure with Grandpa. Um, uh, like I said, Grandpa was very supportive of all of us. And... He taught me a lot of my ways, even my smart mouth. <laughs> I 
I remember um, I asked a stupid question, or no, Tyson had asked a stupid question. And Grandpa looked at me in front of, we were in the front seat, Tyson was in the back. He looked at me, he was like, Tch. he was like, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, ask him, what you, what, you, what you think? So I asked him, I was like, Tyson, like, what do you think? Like, duh. Like, you know, I'm getting my attitude down, okay. So then uh, fast forward a little bit. Um, I remember I had a cell phone and I was texting and I texted a swear word and my mom had went through my phone. And she's like, you text a swear word? I looked at Tyson. I was like, what you think? <laughs> She backhanded me very hard <laughs> with her very big hands. <laughs> um, but Grandpa was awesome. Um, I'm going to try to keep this brief. Uh, every time I'd go see him in the hospital, I asked him, like, Grandpa, how are you feeling? Like, where's your pain at and stuff? And he'd be like, I feel good. <laughs> like, And he said that every time um, up until the last time. Um, and I truly believe that he did rely on God all of his life, and he was coming to terms with the different convictions he had, and I'm glad that he got saved. And um, I just ask you guys to keep our family in, our pray in your prayers. And uh, Quita, I love you so much, and I'm so thankful for you. And... <laughs> Thank you for literally dropping your life to take care of Grandpa. There's so many blessings coming for you. Mom, Uncle John, Auntie LaVon, Uncle Winslow, stay strong, and I love you guys. We all love you guys, and thanks for coming out to support our family today. Uh, before we speak, we're going to allow uh, Prince to speak. Prince is uh, family to us, uh, along with uh, the rest of Tiffany's family. Tiffany is Terrell's god sister, and um, this is her child, and he would like to speak today. Um, so we, um, so we always had good times with Grandpa, and we and we always loved him. And my speech was um, going to be, um, we. We loved um, him, and and we had good times together. And as long as we, and as long as we don't forget him in our hearts, he never left. How's everybody doing? Um, I'm Javier Guerrero. And I'm John Willis the third. I put a little something together for him today, and it goes, it's called Three for Three. Three for Three. All right. First, there was Orlando Lamar Willis, then Maggie Levine Willis, and now John Lavette Sr. Three for Three. On my father's side, have made it into heaven, and hallelujah. We are three for three, and we thank God for that. My grandfather was a very competitive man, especially when playing checkers. That was his favorite game. He didn't like to lose, and we don't either. So we stand proud today to say that we are three for three. three, for three. Grandpa didn't like to lose, and God doesn't like to lose souls to the enemy either. And we thank God for that also today. For a long time, I thought my grandfather was a hard man. But over time, I learned that he wasn't. He was a hard lover, and there's a big difference. John LeVette Willis Sr. was a little rough around the edges, but you would never know that by the way he wore a suit. And that man could wear a suit. A hard lover is straightforward. A hard lover has no filter with their feelings or their responses. A hard lover is honest. More honest than you like at times, but always honest. Grandpa would always ask me, where's your wife at? And when are you going to get married? 
Grandpa, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm working on it. He would ask me this so much that it finally hit me one day. Grandpa was big on family. As I look out at all my family today, most of you are branches from Grandpa's roots. And what a beautiful tree. Our family is huge. Our family is loving. Our family is funny, successful, and caring. But most of all, our family is God-fearing. God-fearing. That is Grandpa's legacy. That is what we believe Grandpa's journey was here on earth. To bring our beautiful family into the Church of God here in Jackson, Michigan. In 1971, John LeVette Willis Sr. was linked with Pastor Frank Hampton Jr. And say what you will, but it was destiny. My grandfather, through a series of crazy events, connected our family with the congregation of Church of God, Jackson, Michigan. And what a blessing it has been. Generation to generation, the Lord adopted our family as my grandmother, Maggie, installed in us the belief of the Most High consistently since birth. And we thank God for our grandfather. If it wasn't for Grandpa, where would we be? Think about that for a moment. Where would we be? I learned a lot from my grandpa throughout the years, and most of it, the Lord has purged out of me. <laughs> Glory be to God. <laughs> But the one thing I learned from Grandpa has yet to leave me, and in fact is growing more and more each day, and that is the love for God. Grandpa taught us to fear God and thank God always, never to be a fool. In fact, his definition of a fool was a man who didn't believe in God. I love you, Grandpa John. You was my friend and my trouble buddy, but it seems we both put that life behind us and are moving on. I look forward to seeing you one day, but until then, your legacy will live on through your namesake, which today I am truly honored and blessed to have. I love you, Grandpa, and I miss you. And God bless you all. Thank today. you for coming. Thank you for those beautiful remarks, beautiful grandchildren. This time we're going to have remarks from the children in the song. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank God for the time that he gave us with my dad. I want to thank the saints for their prayers and how they rally with us. I want to thank my mom for the way she raised us in the church of God and her stand for the truth and showing us what salvation looks like. We didn't grow up with a lot of money, but we grew up with the same mother and a lot of love. I'm grateful for that. I want to thank my family for sticking together. Even though we don't always see eye to eye, we, dis we agree to disagree and we keep it moving. And I appreciate that. I want to thank my nieces and nephews for the help and the time that they gave when these last few months became difficult and for the love they've shown to their grandfather. I love all of my family. Thank you. Some call him pastor, but he's more like my brother. Lee, I can't thank you enough the way you've been there for us. We love and genuinely appreciate you. 
I would like to thank my best friend of 30 years, Liz. She's a certified registered nurse anesthetist, very medically inclined, and she's been here and checking on me and my family regular during all of this. Thank you for answering our medical questions and taking the time to explain medical information to in, in detail. Thank you for questioning and for some of your suggestions about my dad's care to the medical staff at Henry Ford Allegiance during my dad's stay. We love you, sis. Saving the best for last, I would like to thank my husband because for the past few months, I've spent a lot of time away from home, away from work in Jackson, helping Shaquita and the rest of my family in whatever ways I could with taking care of my dad. As long as, we had, had, as long as my husband had a clean house and food, he never complained. He just took care of home. And I came home to a clean house every time. I love you, Mr. Tyrants. Thank you. Not long ago, when my dad became unable to walk, he was more comfortable with me doing certain things. <laughs> because Levon and Queen are his prissy girls. So they would go in his room like, hi, Daddy. How are you doing today? Or, hey, Daddy, what you want to eat? Me, I guess I'm like the fourth son, so I'm the tomboy. So I just walk in there like, what up, daddy? <laughs> this is what we about to do. Here's your food. We about to sit up and eat, or I'm about to get you up in your chair, whatever demands. And for the most part, he did it. We created a bond during that time, and we had a lot of conversations. The most meaningful conversation was us making peace with our past. And he didn't fail to remind me that I was bad. I explained to him that they kind of forced me to be independent. I told him that John was his first boy and the baby for three years, so he was special. Then came Levon, the first girl, and she was a baby for seven years. Then went seven years without a baby, then came Orlando, another boy. So they were excited about him, and he was almost a perfect child from birth to death. Fourteen months later, pops up Marcina. Then fourteen months later, here comes Winslow, and he was a baby for four years. Then comes this beautiful baby girl named Quita, and she's been the baby for 40 years. So I had no choice but to grow up. Um, after all of that explaining, my dad looked at me and laughed, and he said, so that's what happened. A few months ago, I got him up in his chair, and we played checkers, and I had to walk away for a minute, so I reminded him, Daddy, you're saved now. Don't cheat. Because anybody who has ever played my dad in any game knows he was a serial cheater. He legit beat me in that game. And when I tried to explain that I hadn't played checkers in years, he said, I don't want to hear it. So if y'all wonder where I get my trash talking from, it was John Willis. And I don't have no problem continuing that part of my dad's legacy. My years as a single mother was easier because regardless to where I was going or what I was doing, when I needed my dad to come babysit Tiana Tyson, he was there with just one phone call. I think Tian became that baby girl after Levine and Quita grew up. My dad loved all of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but he lost count after so many. A few months ago, my dad got saved, and a peace about his death came over me. So when the time got closer, I stayed pretty strong. Sunday before last, I got home and prepared myself to watch the Super Bowl. And I got a call from Quita, and dad had taken a turn for the worse in that short time. So I called my husband and told him that I was going back to Jackson. I packed a bag and drove back to Jackson and spent that night at my dad's bedside. On Monday afternoon, I knew that my husband and Tyson had to work, so I needed to go pick up little Larry. So I drove back to Detroit, picked up little Larry, and went back to my dad's bedside. On Tuesday morning, we switched shifts with my dad at his bedside. I drove to our daughter Keisha's house. When I was pulled up in the driveway, something just didn't feel right. And I just didn't feel right leaving. So I called my husband and said, I think I should stay. I don't feel to leave. He said, baby, didn't stay. <laughs> So I called little Larry and said, you're going to stay. I'm going back out to my dad. I got back around 8.45 a.m. -ish. I sat there with family, and I watched my dad the entire time. Around 9.15-ish, I noticed his respirations were slower than they should be. Due to my medical experience, I know the respirations are 12 to 9 is normal. My dad's was only 9. I knew this was about to be it. We surrounded his bed, held his hand, rubbed his pretty hair. He didn't give me that. And we told him that we loved him, and we watched his, I watched his pulse and his respirations get slower and slower until he peacefully took his last breath at 9.23 a.m. I thank God that my dad was, went as peaceful as he did. I thank God that my dad got saved. And even though the sting of death hurts, I'm actually at peace. Again, thanks to everyone for the calls, texts, messages, monetary donations, the food, and for checking on us during this time. Rest easy, Daddy. We love you.
First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out. A couple of things the family has asked me to share with you all. I was going to say originally when I got up here, we when we asked to do something, we usually come up, we sing, and we go. My mom would always say, somebody asked you to sing, go sing. Don't talk. Sing and go. For the last 40 minutes now, I can see why my mom said just sing, don't talk. So <laughs> it, it kind of figured that out. Um, hearing a lot of real good things about my dad, uh, all the love, all the good things. And my dad was crazy. I don't know what y'all talking about. <laughs> my dad was crazy. My dad feared nothing. In fact, if you look at my siblings, every one of them has some of my dad's temper. Actually, all of them, except one. I don't want to say who, who doesn't have. But all the rest of them have my, my, my dad's temperament. My dad was quick to smile, but he was also quick to let you know what he think, what he thought. I would always tell my kids, my father had a thing where you don't fear anything but God. That was my dad's thing. You don't fear no man. You don't fear no job. You don't fear no work. You don't fear nothing but God. And he lived by that most of his life. He didn't care who you were, what you were supposed to be, whether you're the pastor, whether you're the police, it didn't matter. Whatever he had to say, whatever he had to do, if you got in the way, there was going to be problems. One of my favorite tougher than your dad stories is when I was in sixth grade. I had a teacher named George Michelos, who used to be a Minnesota Viking, uh, Minnesota Viking linebacker. Something happened in class where he, he embarrassed me and did something. And when he turned his head, I, I stuck my middle finger up at the teacher. And uh, um, all my dad's behavior, he never allowed this type of behavior for us. But the teacher decided he, because he knew my dad supported discipline and stuff, he would, he would swap me. And at this time in school, they had these little rulers. And he tapped, tapped, brought me up in front of the class and gave me three swats. I started crying. I went down to the office called my dad. My dad drove up in a Cadillac all the way up to the front door of the classroom. Not the school, he drove across the grass, across the playground to the front door of the classroom and he came in class to find out who's giving out swats because he's finna give out some swats. He dealt with me later, but every teacher in that school knew from that point on the Willises don't get swats. He made that very clear that that's who my dad was. It didn't matter where he was. One of those things I always like to say, I kind of feel like for a while, Domino's Pizza was started in Ypsilanti right down the street from where we lived. I always think my dad was kind of behind. They had a 30 minutes, it used to be 30 minutes or, or, or free. And I think my dad was kind of the reason they got rid of that. Because they came in, we went to get a pizza one time and the pizza was 30 minutes of free and it was more than 30 minutes. So I'm in there with my dad, little boy, probably seven, eight years old. He said, where's my pizza? He said, science said 30 minutes. He said, he said no, it's 30 minutes of free, so you'll be free of your time. My dad took out a pistol, started shooting up in the building, inside of the building. That, that was my dad. And shortly after that, I don't know how soon, but it was no more 30 minutes of free pizzas from Domino's Pizza. So I think he had something to do with that worldwide change. But my, my father was, was a sharp, sharp businessman, um, uh, ran a business, Willis Aircraft Service, his largest business year. I think he, his net around there, he told me he was doing his death rate. He said his largest debt was just around just over $600,000 a year in 1973-74, which is equivalent to like five, six million today. But he, he ran his business. Every year we bought, he bought new Cadillacs. Uh, we had three Corvairs in the back. He had Model Fords, Chrysler k cars, anything that we wanted, he would do. And the, the, that's who my dad was. He was a real quick thinker. Like talk about checkers, chess, kings on the corner. He cheated in everything. Didn't matter what he was. He knew what you were going to do, and he was already, already prepared for that. The story that I want to share before we sing is how he met my mom. My mother was a music major at Savannah State College. And my Aunt Juanita had a beauty shop. She worked in the beauty shop. She was a beautician there. My dad owned some buildings. And I guess him and a guy had got into it. My mom was sitting in the beauty chair getting the hair done. My dad was in a fight with some people. He came inside, went in upside to get a gun and go back outside and he seen this girl. He said, you, you, you're gonna be my wife. In the middle of a fight, in the middle of a fight. So I asked my mom, I'm like, what, what did that say to you? He was fighting when you met him. What, what, what did that say to you? But in the middle of the fight, he let her know that she was going to be his wife. I, I don't know how the relationship blossomed after that. And my aunt never it, but he, he ended up being his wife. And he maintained the same personality through, through all, all, of the, all of their lives. Always my dad, always willing to fight anything he had to do for what he, what he felt was right. My father had like, like nine lives. And when he met my mom, just to add to that, my dad was not from Church of God. My, my dad's family was a big Pleasant Grove Baptist Church down south. My mother and those grew up Church of God. But it was something about what they grew up in that stuck out with my dad. 
And when he moved up to, to Michigan, his job moved him from, uh, we lived all over. We lived in Ohio, Texas, uh, not Ohio, I'm sorry, uh, Texas, Virginia, Oklahoma, Georgia, California, uh, Hawaii. We, we looked, his job took him all over the place. And me and Levine, we, we moved to all, where, where, where we were. The rest of them didn't come until later when we moved here to Michigan. And he finally moved to Detroit. And anyway, sometimes during, between his employment, he heard on the radio Pastor Hampton preaching a message. And something about that message just rang true to my dad. At the time, my mom and dad were separated. My mom was actually living in Georgia. But something about that rang true to my dad. And my mom and dad, my mom finally came here. She was going to a church of God in Ypsilanti. My mom was like, my dad was like, you got to come here to this church. First time we brought my mom to the church, she had on like a mini skirt and everything. I always tell her, I'm bringing her up to the church of God. But whatever it was, he knew it. It was real enough to stick out with my mom. And my mom came here, gave her heart to God, here to the church of God. Ever since then, there's been a relationship with my family. My dad, well, he was quick to cuss you out. He would cuss you out about the Church of God. Before, before he got, he would cuss you out about the Church of God. I mean, you, you want to hear him respond really, really quick. You try to say something negative about Brother Hampton about the Church of God. He, 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 was, he was ready to go to war. And, and in the end, and like I want to thank Frog was saying, my dad had always said, you know, he, he just felt like he had so many things in his life that he would never get that opportunity. He just wanted to make sure that we all had that opportunity. And he gave his life for that. Um, My Lord. <clears throat> he was a crier. <laughs> uh, Basil used to always say, "My dad could cry so many ways. He could make the tears come out here. He can make them come down. He can make them drop down real slow. He can make them come out fast. He he just he he, he was a crier." But uh, my greatest thing about my dad was the last movie made. You know, that was the right move. So today, in honor of him, in two songs, he said, we always sing. We're going to sing. But uh, to think that my dad, I, I don't know how heaven's arrangement set up. But I imagine if there's some gates there somewhere, he probably had to go through like four or five gates. He probably had to check to make sure this is the right address where you're coming from this gate there. But uh, Dad, you made it. Me and my dad went through a lot. But uh, We were able to make peace. We talked. I said, Dad, you good with me, man? You good with me? I see him transition over peacefully. Just meant the world to me. So wait for us here. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and a perfect comes from you. You, you're the heart, my contentment, hope for all. I do, oh Jesus, you're the center of my joy. When I've lost my direction, 
You're the compass for my way. You are the fire at night. When nights are long and a cold in sadness. You are the laughter shatters all my fears when I'm all alone. Your hand is there to hold. Family sing with me. Jesus, Human. you're the center of my joy. Oh, 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 oh. good and perfect comes from, from you. For you see, you are. You're the heart mm -hmm. of my contentment. Hope for all I do. center of my joy listen you are why I find pleasure in simple things in life you are the music in the meadows and the breeze and you are the voices of all these children. Family, my name, I will give to you this song of highest praise. Family, sing with me. Jesus, you are you're the center oh, of my joy. Sounds so pretty. Won't you sing it for that? Good and perfect comes from you. Mm -hmm. You are you're the heart hey, hey. of my and bless it for all I do. That's why we're singing Jesus. Jesus. You are. You are. The center. The center. Of my joy. When I'm all alone. Jesus. When my friends are gone. You are. In the middle of the storm. The center. You are my joy. Of my Joy. 